Our first Bible reading for this morning comes from Malachi chapter 3, reading verses 1 to 7. And these words will serve as a basis of this morning's sermon. We hear. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the coming of his who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows, the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice, but do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of our Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The portion of God's word that we're going to focus on this morning is our first Bible reading from Malachi chapter 3. That's guys get meditation on that word? Let's pray. Lord, we know that you are coming soon. And so in these days, in this, in this time, before you return, may we be continually purified and refined according to your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, so yes, it's Advent, so we are preparing for the Lord's arrival. He will come soon and it will be sudden. And that freaked the Jews out. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears. Because they had good reason to be afraid for when Christ would return. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. That is kind of a good history of the Israelites. You know, when they were brought out of Egypt, brought out of slavery in Egypt, and they were there on Mount Sinai and, and made that, uh, that two-sided covenant that God said, if you follow my laws and my decrees, then I'm going to bless you. You're going to stay in this land. You're going to prosper. It's going to be great. But if you disobey, well, then I'm going to pull you from this land, and you won't have these blessings. And it took them just a matter of days, weeks, before they already were actively breaking these commands from God. But yet God was very patient, not wanting anyone to perish. And so he allows them still to come and enter the promised land. He allows them to be there for hundreds of years before finally the patience was up. It was time to judge them, and the Israelites were exiled. They were conquered by the Babylonians, exiled away from their homeland. But still the Lord was patient, and he was merciful. He kept his promises, and 70 years' time, he brings the Israelites back to Jerusalem, and there they rebuild the entire city, they rebuild the temple, worship resumes, the people had repented, they had turned away from their sin, things were going well, their zeal was renewed for the Lord, and then a little bit more time passes. And they backslid in their faith again. In Malachi, the things he's dealing with, what the prophet has to preach about, is that the priests, they were offering very bad sacrifices. They were offering crippled, maimed, diseased, blind animals. These were the animals that as they sacrificed, and they were meant to foreshadow the perfect sacrifice that God would bring, the perfect sacrifice needed to remove our sins. What the priests were bringing weren't even fit to put before the governor, and yet they were bringing them before God. Making matters even worse, these same Levites had divorced their believing wives. 
divorced them so that they could marry unbelieving foreign wives. These were meant to be the role models of faith for the people of Israel, and they had failed God in so many ways. Their, their zeal for the Lord, their, their endeavor, their, their desire to do things for God had just fallen backwards. So who of them could stand when the Lord came to judge them? They needed to be purified, they needed to be refined. And who of us can't say the same? Have you noticed any backsliding in your faith life? That you once had some like really great spiritual habits, really great things that you would do for the Lord, and you do because you believe in the Lord, and then it, something happened and it just kind of changed? Like you used to read your Bible every single day, but now you don't. You used to pray before meals, and now it's kind of, huh, I'm forgetting to do that. You know, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much into our schedule to disrupt us and to get us out of good, godly habits, good, godly things that we do. It's kind of like working out. You skip one day, and it doesn't seem so bad, but then all of a sudden, the next day comes, and you want to skip again, and before you know it, you kind of stop doing what you were supposed to be doing. Or maybe it's not just a disruption in schedule, that you had good habits, and they've kind of fallen by the wayside, but maybe you feel like that when it comes to your struggle against sin. Yeah, you know, it's, it's pointed out to you often enough, I am an unworthy sinner. I've had my heart just cut so many times because I do the things I know I shouldn't do. And then I say, God, I'm sorry, because I really didn't want to do it, but I, I know I, I did. And then we try again. Try not to do it. And it works well for a while. And then that moment comes. A moment you didn't mean to toy with, that you didn't mean to entertain, and yet you just decided, why not? And you fell into the same sin again. And now the accusations of your conscience are plaguing you all over again, and the cycle repeats, and you try again, and you do well again for a while, but then you fall into the sin again, and then you get to that point where this has happened so many times that you're so frustrated with yourself, you're wondering, do I even believe in the Lord? I mean, I, I know I shouldn't be doing these sins, and yet I keep on doing them. What, what's wrong with me? Was I ever really repentant? And then you know there's Satan standing over there too, calling out to God, you see? You see? This person, they, they don't belong to you. They're just a sinner like everybody else. There's no change, nothing different about them. You know what? Why don't you just judge them? Because they don't deserve to be in your presence. They don't deserve to belong to you. Why don't you lump them together in this trial, God, that you said you're going to have, that you can come and put them on trial just like you said you would be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me. Why don't you just judge them with all of them, God? They're no better. And yeah, as we look at our lives, we know we need to be purified. And we know that we need to be refined. God knows that too. God knows that no matter how hard we try, if we are going to rely on our own efforts to change our lives, to, to put away sin and to not do it anymore, it's never going to happen. So our God takes action. He takes action. He calls it out through the prophet Malachi, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord actually prophesies two messengers. The first messenger we have kind of been focused on because it's the season of Advent. It's John the Baptist, the messenger who comes to prepare the way for the Lord, the one who came 
to not point out necessarily something novel to the people, but to say, yes, I'm going to call out your sin. I'm going to call out the things that you are doing wrong. But then, as John did, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's ministry was not just to say, man, you guys really stink at this whole being pure thing. You're really bad at keeping God's commands. But he was to say, I want to point you to the one who actually came to take away your sin. He's even walking here among us. Look, there's Jesus. There's the one that God has brought to be our substitute on this world, the one to live perfectly for us. In fact, the first messenger points to the second messenger, the messenger of the covenant. Because that's who Jesus is. And it's not the two-sided covenant. It's not the covenant from Mount Sinai anymore of do this and you will be blessed. Don't do this and you'll be punished. No, it's the one-sided covenant that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And then when Adam and Eve fell into sin, the first thing God does after asking, what you do? He goes to Satan and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and yours. He will crush your head. The offspring of the woman will crush your head, Satan. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to destroy this relationship that you've created. I'm going to destroy sin, and I'm going to save my people. No contingency on our part. God was going to act. And with this new one-sided covenant, he would forgive our wickedness and remember our sins no more. Because it was Christ who came to be that substitute for our lives. Christ who lived perfectly when we know we fight against those temptations and we know as much as we have good intentions, as much as we want to try and never fall into these sins again, we do. But not Christ. No, lived perfectly every moment of his entire life, always saying no to every temptation that came his way. So that then when he sacrificed his life, when his blood was shed for us, then also everything we've ever done wrong was removed. Everything was paid for, the entire punishment. That's God's covenant with us. That's what God points us to which leads us into this whole message of repentance. Repentance is, like you just heard with the kids in that message, it's not just like, oh, I'm sorry, God, I did that again. There is a feeling. It is a feeling of sorrow over our sin, that the things we have done, they have broken our relationship with God. They put up barriers between us and God. They push us away further from Him. And when we recognize that, it grieves us. Because we don't want to be away from our God. We want to be close to Him. So then God intervened into our story. He came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And He has done that for us by His perfect life, by His perfect sacrifice. And so we move from being sorry over our sin to say, But I know, God, You have done it all for me. You have completely accomplished it. And so I have been made pure. That is what changes us. It is the second messenger, the messenger of the covenant, who actually changes us. And we're not just these sinful, vile human beings that Satan stands there and accuses and said, they'll never be good enough. Instead, he says, no, I have made them pure, I have made them holy, I have made them complete. And they belong to me. And that changes how we live. That word repentance, it's, it's this turning around. We're heading towards one thing, but no, no more. We have changed our mind. We have changed our path, our direction, because Christ has purified us. He has made us different. And so we want to live for him. We want to live according to his commands, not because it makes me a better person or, or I earn some more favor by him, but simply because that's what God has made me. And so I want to live it. Live how he has purified me from every sin. But then you and I know, we kind of probably feel like those, those Levitical priests of Malachi. We've been made pure, we know we have the forgiveness of sins, 
We know we've turned away from our sin. We are repentant, but then, then we backslide. And we fall into the sin again. And in that moment, do you ever wonder, was I, was I truly repentant? Was I really forgiven? Was I really made pure? I mean, why would I do this again if that were the case? So that's why God says to people who backslide in their faith, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. It's not so much that just his judgment doesn't change, but think about this. What doesn't change is what our God has done for us. That even when we backslide in our faith, when we fall back into old habits and sinful habits all over again, you know what hasn't changed? The fact that the Lamb of God has taken away your sins. The fact that he still did live that perfect life for you, that he has called you to believe in that holiness and that righteousness. And so that purification, that purity that we so desperately need, it's still right there. It's still what God has won for us, and it's still given to us. Because it's that weird paradox, I'm a sinner, I'm a saint at the same time. So that's where we find our identity back in Christ. That every time we sin, we go back to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to once again to believe He has purified me from all of this sin by His life and His works. And this makes me want to live differently. And so, yep, let's try all over again. Let's say no to the sin. Let's deny that sinful self, that one that was, that was drowned in the waters of my baptism, one that God has purified me of, and live how He has made me new. But that's pretty darn hard. <laughs> because we know that temptation is always there to backslide once again. So we need help. God, we, we can't do this. It's not like just getting the house ready before Christmas and then trying to put everything in, in cupboards and sweeping floors and vacuuming and all of that. It's not just that superficial cleaning. But to come back to Christ and say, you have completely changed me inside. And that makes me want to live differently for you. Now, being purified, God, help me live that purified life. That's why we come and gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to hear with these other people that you too, you're living the same struggle, the same life, and you someday, you backslide too. And you come with the same Savior, the same forgiveness, and you are made pure and holy just the same as I am. Because we have the same God who does not change. And maybe it's time that we recognize maybe we do need to enlist a little bit more help. Maybe instead of trying to just carry on this life of repentance all by ourselves and saying, well, I can just do better, I can just be improved, to actually say to another Christian, can you help me? And guess what? That does open us up into a whole bunch of vulnerability. To not just live in silence about your sins and just keep them to yourselves, but to actually say to somebody else, this is what I wrestle with, can you help me? Because it makes us vulnerable to be judged. And I can't tell you it won't happen. But what I can tell you is that our God still does not change. And so the forgiveness, the purification that he has won for us, that we have, does not change in that moment when you express, I am weak in this and I need help. Because hopefully when you ask somebody to help you, and of course you don't ask somebody you trust very much, somebody who you believe will actually walk this walk of repentance with you, that they'll call you out when you won't that they will point you to Christ when everything seems too dark to see him. That they are going to pray for you, that they will pray with you. That they will encourage you to fight this sinful nature that we have, to know that this is not who we are. We have been made pure, and God is refining us day in and day out because we've been made new, and so now our actions reflect that. 
We live the purity that God has made us. That's the life of repentance. To not just be sorry over our sins and just to give a half-hearted apology, but to say, God, you changed me. Because you lived for me, you took on my sin, you took away from me, you made me pure and holy and complete. So now refine me. Help me to live this life that you have called me to. Then when I fall short, when I backslide, to come right back to you who does not change, to your forgiveness that is always there, and it's total and complete, and you have covered me with it. So refine me, Lord, since you have purified me, so that I am ready for the day of your arrival. Amen.